The 1930s were a tense time for world peace. Developments in Europe and Asia indicated that a second world war might soon erupt. The Canadian government realized that the defense of its own country hinged on the protection of Newfoundland and Labrador. An enemy invasion there would leave Canada's east coast vulnerable to attack and threaten convoy routes. Furthermore, ore extracted from the mines on Bell Island was vital to Canada's steel industry, and the airports at Gander and Botwood were at the forefront of transatlantic flight. But there was a problem. Newfoundland and Labrador had no effective defenses. There were virtually no troops, no guns, and no fortifications. Aware that the Newfoundland government didn't have the resources to quickly create and then properly maintain defenses, the British, Canadian, and Newfoundland governments agreed that Canada would assume responsibility. Addressing Parliament on September 8, 1939, Canadian Prime Minister Mackenzie King stated that the integrity of Newfoundland and Labrador is essential to the security of Canada. By contributing as far as we are able to the defense of Newfoundland and the other British and French territories in this hemisphere, we will not only be defending Canada, but we will also be assisting Great Britain and France. In the coming years, Canada spent large sums of money to expand the airports at Gander and Botwood, build a naval base at St. John's, a ship repair facility at nearby Bay Bulls, and air bases at Torbay and Goose Bay. Construction did not truly get underway until the spring and summer of 1940, after Nazi Germany had defeated France and occupied much of Western Europe. Worried that North America would be next if England could not hold out, the Canadian military obtained permission from the Newfoundland government, with British approval, to station air and ground forces at Gander and Botwood in June. The Canadians were not the only friendly invaders. In 1941, the United States also secured permission to establish military bases at Newfoundland and Labrador, American personnel began to arrive in large numbers at Stephenville, Argentia, and St. John's. American detachments were also stationed alongside Canadian troops at the Gander and Goose Bay airfields and in a number of smaller communities of strategic importance, like Sandy Cove and St. Bride's, where radar sites were installed. At the height of the military occupation, there were approximately 6,000 Canadians and 10,000 Americans in Newfoundland and Labrador. There was some unease in Ottawa about the large American presence. Canada now recognized that it had important and permanent interests in Newfoundland and Labrador, and these interests had to be protected. This was a major reason for the establishment of a Canadian High Commission in St. John's in July 1941. It was an office traditionally reserved for self-governing dominions. For Newfoundland and Labrador, the Second World War initiated a time of great economic prosperity. The Canadian and American governments spent millions of dollars to build the military bases, and the resulting construction boom created thousands of high-paying jobs for local workers. Local businesses also flourished. Base contractors bought timber and raw materials from local lumber companies, and visiting troops spent large sums of money at local stores, restaurants, and other businesses. By 1941, unemployment had almost disappeared. The public purse also benefited. Newfoundland boasted the first in a series of financial surpluses in 1941, and it began to make interest-free loans to Great Britain, which had been its former creditor. Newfoundland was once again financially self-supporting, and it was widely assumed that the commission of government would be replaced soon after the war. Many people believed that Newfoundland and Labrador would revert to the independent status it held prior to 1934. 
However, by the end of the war in 1945, senior Canadian officials had decided that, if at all possible, Newfoundland and Labrador should be brought into confederation. For the past five years, the Newfoundland and Canadian governments had worked well together and created an integrated defense scheme. Canada controlled vital strategic installations and it did not want to see Newfoundland drift into the American sphere of influence. Simply put, Newfoundland had become important to Canada in a way it had never been in the past. Perhaps it should become a Canadian province. It wasn't just Canada that was seeing things in a new light. The war had also helped Newfoundland and Labrador to shift from a North Atlantic orientation to a North American one. Its economy had become more integrated with Canada's than ever before. The flow of workers between Newfoundland and the mainland increased, as did the number of imports. In contrast, ties with Britain were weakened. In 1939, Newfoundland and Labrador had imported 37% of its goods from Canada and 24% from the United Kingdom. By 1945, Canada's share had jumped to 61%, while Britain's had dropped to 4 Less quantifiable were the social impacts brought about by the sudden exposure of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians to the thousands of American and Canadian military personnel stationed in their previously isolated country. Establishments like the Caribou Hut and the Red Triangle Club hosted dances and other forms of entertainment which promoted extensive intermingling between resident civilians and foreign troops. Marriages between local women and visiting servicemen were not uncommon. The presence of so many Canadians and Americans, complete with their entertainment and consumer goods, gave many Newfoundlanders and Labradorians a taste for the higher quality of living associated with North American lifestyles. The British government was also thinking about Newfoundland's future. Like officials in Ottawa, it favoured confederation with Canada. But what did the Newfoundlanders and Labradorians want? The Dominion Secretary, Clement Attlee, visited the island in 1942 to find out. This was followed one year later by a goodwill mission of three British members of Parliament. These investigations showed that although very few people seemed to support Confederation, there was widespread unease about an immediate and unconditional return to responsible government status. That there had been no democratic government in Newfoundland and Labrador since 1934 was of particular concern to Clement Attlee. He thought that a process of political education had to take place before Newfoundlanders and Labradorians decided on their future. Another factor worried the British. They were concerned that once the wartime boom ended, the Newfoundland economic situation could rapidly deteriorate. If the country was independent, might it collapse again, as it had in the early 1930s? Would Britain once again be called upon to help out? Eventually, the Dominion's office in London decided that there would not be an immediate return to responsible government at the end of the war. Instead, an elected national convention would be set up in 1946. Its job was to examine Newfoundland and Labrador's economic situation and recommend possible future forms of government. A subsequent referendum would allow the people to decide just which form of government would take office. In 